All right. Okay, we're doing it. Here we go. Here we go. Hey, let's do a poll. How many of you grew up with siblings? Where are our only children? We're here for you. We love you. Some of the people who are only children are like, listen, it was awesome. Okay, right? So I, I grew up with just one younger brother. His name's Rob. Some of you have met him. Uh, he is, him and his family are part of our community here at Mill City, and he leads our partner every meal. And so I thought it would be fun for you to see this awesome picture of us from my senior year of high school. Ah, look at us. Yes, we are wearing matching hemp necklaces. Those were very cool in the 90s. Are those back? No? I don't think they are. Okay, not back yet. Anyway, uh, this picture of Rob and I, you know, when we, when we look at pictures from the past or yesterday, you think of the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And you're like, oh, there's just like a bunch of things we can think about this picture. Here's the thing. This picture is missing a thousand words. And that is because we look like we are perfect little angels who love to match and wear similar items and look so cute. Not like people who ever have conflict or are fighting all the time, right? Except that we were those kids that sometimes got into it. And it started verbally and then might have ended up with some elbows or some shoving. And if I'm being completely honest, I usually started it. <laughs> Maybe you get along perfectly with your siblings. I, I don't know, but I'm sure it wasn't just us, yeah? The only children are like, see, this is what I'm saying. This picture is not, there's a, like thousands of words that are missing from this picture. Because you know what else this picture doesn't show? It shows that this was right before a really challenging time in our lives. It doesn't show that we had been living with a dad with a terminal illness. And just a couple of months after this picture, we lost him. It doesn't show the thousands of words that could be used for how the pain from all of that was sometimes coming out sideways, right? Directed at each other or at my poor mom sometimes and or some unexpected person at school. <laughs> because that's what happens when you're facing things in your life. And that picture doesn't show all of that, does it? But by the grace of God, honestly, that suffering really brought us together. And now it's easy for me to say he's one of my best friends. Um, but I will be honest and say we still, still do sometimes have conflict, right? And this brings up a question for me that I know I have thought about so many times in life. When we think about our relationships, why as humans are we not even able to have peace with those who are closest to us? Like, Why are we not able to have peace with those we know we love and they love us? Much less our neighbors or those who are very different than us in various ways or those who we have conflict with that we barely know. Many, if not most of us, would realize that the deepest conflict in our lives is often the lack of peace we've experienced with people we're related to or the people that we're closest to relationally. Research is showing, and this is probably not shocking, that there's an increased pervasive sense of conflict happening in families. Now it's on the rise in the U.S. in the midst of these divisive times. It's happening amongst siblings, amongst extended family members, spouses, children. There is this growing lack of peace even amongst our closest relationships. And I know just from hearing your stories that many of you, you are, have been or currently are facing this in a deep way right now when it comes to the people in your families. And so today, we're going to be finishing this conversation we've been having on the, just the first 12 verses of the Sermon on the Mount. These nine provocative statements that Jesus makes to open up the most well-known and powerful collection of his teachings. Matthew 5, if you have a Bible or an app, and we'll have it on the screen. These statements have come to be known as the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. And there are three lefts that we're going to look at today, and they are on the topic of peacemaking. Peacemaking. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. And over the last few weeks, we've been talking about how the best way to use that word blessed is probably the good life or the fortunate ones. The good life belongs to the peacemakers. But here's the thing. Peacemaking is not for the faint of heart. As we've all experienced, the pervasiveness of conflict goes well beyond our family systems. Obviously, in churches, in schools, in neighborhoods, and beyond. In the workplace, get this, according to the Society for Human Resource Management, there are 202 million cases of incivility a day in the United States. And they're estimating that that is costing over $2 billion to U.S. companies because of a lack of productivity and absenteeism and people who aren't showing up to work because of the cost of incivility in the workplace. 
And then, of course, clearly, we are in polarized times as we approach an election that is 16 days away. Woo, deep breaths, deep breaths. Sociologists are studying this current state of political polarization in the U.S., and they are saying that statistically we are mo more polarized than we have been in the last 50 years. Some of you lived through 1975 and beyond. Before that, the significant tension that was happening, the civil rights movement was continuing, the Vietnam War had ended, Watergate had blown up and shocked the country politically, there was economic strain. Then let's just zoom out just a little bit further, all the way to the global perspective. Um, I've talked about this before. The Council of Foreign Relations keeps a close eye on the 28 major conflicts happening around the world right now. And by tomorrow, there might be 29. So as we look at this final set of Beatitudes, these statements of Jesus bring up a deep question for us in our lives. How might we follow Jesus as peacemakers? Not merely peacekeepers and not peace fakers, but peacemakers. How do we follow Jesus as peacemakers? So here's the plan today. First, I want to look at what Jesus said and what it meant in that first context. I want to look briefly at the context in which Jesus was speaking, like what was happening in that community. And then let's talk about what it looks like for us to be peacemakers in the polarized and divisive times we find ourselves in today. So what is Jesus' invitation to those who were listening to him then? And what is his invitation to us today when it comes to pursuing peace in divisive times? So I'm going to actually read the Bible Project uh, paraphrase. We've been reading their paraphrase a little bit here now, just because I think it's a little bit clarifying and helpful. But feel free to read it in the NIV or another translation that you want to read. But let me just put the, the Bible Project paraphrase up here. Matthew 5, verses 9 through 12. The good life belongs to those who are peacemakers because they will be called the children of God. The good life belongs to those who are being persecuted for the sake of doing what is right, because theirs is the kingdom of God. The good life belongs to y'all. They're saying y'all because it's corporate in that first setting. Uh, the good life belongs to y'all when people insult you, when people persecute you, when people spread evil lies about you on account of me. Y'all need to celebrate and shout for joy when that happens, because your reward is great in heaven. And because this is the way they persecuted the prophets who have come before you. We've been talking about how upon first reading, what Jesus says is the good life doesn't always sound very good, does it? So what did Jesus mean? He's using this word peace, peacemaker. In Greek here, it's Irene or Irene. Somebody, anybody named Irene? Your name means peace. Uh, peacemaker here usually translates as calm and serene. But what we know is that Jesus, even though the first century uh, we see that the written word was in Greek, Jesus was probably speaking Aramaic, which has its written Hebrew. And so even though the written here that we have in Matthew is in Greek, Jesus was probably referring to the, Bible, the, the concept of the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom. Shalom in Hebrew is not the absence of war, stress, or anxiety. That would be escapism, right? Shalom is wholeness completeness, fulfillment, inner rest, living without deficiency or lack. Sounds good, right? So peace here in the Sermon on the Mount, it's important to see throughout Scripture and here in the sermon is not merely an absence of conflict. When left to ourselves, conflict, or I would say pseudo-peace, is kind of our default setting. When left to ourselves, we end up finding conflicts. The peacemaker's peace the peacemakers who are trying to make peace, is something that has to be made. It's something that the peacemaker has to work towards. Something that they have to put effort into. And it's so easy for us right now as we think about this world today to look around and to see the tension in our polarized times like I just mentioned. But let's, before we go there, let's talk about what was happening in Jesus' context. Because it helps us understand what he was saying, but it also helps us to understand the power of the words that he was speaking. So here is my disclaimer for you. I do not encourage to make overly direct parallels to what was happening in the first century in that time. Because our world is very different. So don't overly make connections there. However, I bet some of what I explained to you is going to sound familiar in different ways. Maybe it echoes some of the experiences that they were having. Okay? So we've already discussed in this series that the first century Jewish community was under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And so we've discussed that a little bit. But here we see that scholars don't think that Jesus is referring to conflict with the Romans. It's interesting, isn't it? 
When he declares these last three Beatitudes, rather Jesus is referring to the deep conflict happening within the Jewish community. He's talking about peacemaking amongst the people you're around every day. And so there was this division within Judaism. There was these four main sects within Judea- Judaism. So I'm just going to really briefly highlight these. First, we have the Sadducees. These are the elites, the people that often were separate from the common people. The highest of the high priests, often very wealthy. But here's the thing. They were willing to collude with Rome if it meant that they could keep their status and keep their power. And then we have the Pharisees. The Pharisees, these are the scholars who see themselves as quite holy And they, you know, are experts in the Torah. They're experts in the Hebrew scriptures, what we now call the Old Testament. And they are also pretty politically powerful and wealthy amongst the community. But they're more kind of like the on the ground amongst the people people. But they're the very holy people, of course. And then we have the Essenes. The Essenes are the separatists. They're living together in kind of this this kind of cloistered area near the Dead Sea, away from the other people in the Jewish community. They are legalistic about following the Jewish laws and the Jewish way of life, the religious laws. They are dedicated to saying, okay, well, all of us here in our little area, we are going to purify and cleanse our community. And so we're going to do that by, by being separate. They, they, to deal with the issues in Jewish life and in temple practice and all of the disagreements, they just get away from it. They just withdraw. And then finally, we have the Zealots. These are the four major groups. The Zealots. This is a pretty radically militant group, if we're being clear about what they were about. They were willing to resort to violence. They are opposed to the Romans, but they're also opposed to the Sadducees. Why? Because those Sadducees, they are colluding with the Romans. And they're opposed to the Pharisees. Why? Because the Pharisees aren't teaching things the way they think they should be teaching them. And so they are pretty much opposed to everybody. And the Zealots, they are the people who about 150 years prior to Jesus had led this revolt and they killed a lot of people. And so we know at this point in the story that they were willing to resort to violence. Okay, to summarize these four groups, how are they approaching peace? The Sadducees keep peace by aligning with the powerful. The Pharisees keep peace by fidelity to the laws and the tradition. The Essenes keep peace by withdrawing from those who disagree with you. And the Zealots make peace by declaring war. And this is a simple understanding of this. And then there was a bunch of people who I think were caught up between these groups. They were people who had a lot of pressure to take sides and to align with one of these groups. That part sounds familiar, doesn't it? So again, not to overly connect that, but there's some familiarity to the lack of peace they were experiencing within their community, to what many of us are experiencing today. And Jesus is speaking about peace in their own community, not trying to find peace with the Roman dictators. That's very important for what Jesus is saying here. He wants his listeners to start with the relationships right around them, right around them, the places where they can actively make Peace, actively work for peace with the people that they spend the most of their time with. How did Jesus make peace? How did Jesus do this? By stepping towards conflict with those in his community, with his family at times, trying to be a part of a way forward. Jesus created peace through generous, self-sacrificial love. That's probably the best summary I could give to Jesus' way of peace. By stepping towards conflict, Jesus created peace through generous, self-sacrificial love. So let me just look at each of these verses here quickly, because there's a lot in each of them. Verse 9, the good life belongs to the peacemakers, because they will be called the children of God. Those who make peace are those who show themselves to be a member of God's family. This is what God's family is about. They reflect the character traits of God. Peacemakers look more and more like Jesus. When we choose to be peacemakers, as hard as it is, we reflect Jesus' heart for the world that God loves. Verse 10, the good life belongs to those who are being persecuted for the sake of doing what is right, because theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, the persecution that Jesus is talking about here is not from the Roman Empire, though that was happening. Let's remember, the persecution he's referring to is coming from the people within their own community. The people who don't think they're doing the peacemaking right. The way they think the peacemaking should be done. 
And this persecution is exactly what we see happen. By the time we get to Matthew 10, just a few chapters after this, we see the disciples begin to experience persecution from their own community because they're following Jesus. We see that happen pretty soon after this. Verse 11 and 12. Okay, there's a lot here. The good life belongs to y'all, to you. When people insult you, when people persecute you, when people spread evil lies about you on account of me. Kind of strange to say, y'all need to celebrate and shout for joy when that happens because your reward is great in heaven and because this is the way they persecuted the prophets who have come before you. Last week, Pastor Ashish talked about the previous triad. And the biggest thing to take away from that is that what matters to Jesus is our hearts. The longing that we have for the kingdom of God. The hunger and thirst for righteousness or the hunger and thirst for right relationships. It leads you to a desire to be a peacemaker even when it's challenging. But here is what Jesus, I think, is trying to say. No matter how good somebody's intentions are, no matter how faithful you're trying to be to the way of Jesus, that doesn't mean you're going to be well received. Jesus is giving that, I think, out of his love, he's saying that that's the reality. In fact, he's saying expect people to misunderstand you, to potentially make fun of you, and maybe even in this context, talking about physical harm that could happen. And I know that the word persecution is a tough word. It can mean a lot of things in our context. But I think simply put, in this context, many of us experience the reality that following Jesus will cost us something. And that's what's happening here. It's costing them relationally amongst their own community. But we have to remember that Jesus is not talking about outside groups coming in to persecute their community. That is a different subject. He's actually talking about how they're going to be treated by the people they were supposed to be able to trust. The people that they know. So then Jesus mentions a reward. Okay, great, great. What's the reward? Let's get a reward up in here. The reward is that you are participating in the redemption story of God. That this is what Jesus is about. You get to be a part of it. He didn't need to invite us in, but God did invite us in. And we know the end of the story, don't we? We know the end of the story is that God's perfect shalom covers the earth. When Jesus returns, everything is healed. And we get to join into that right now. So here's what I think is encouraging to us. As we join into peacemaking in our everyday spaces, the places you find yourselves right now, guess what? That matters forever. It matters eternally. It's not in vain. It's building up towards something that Jesus is going to do. We know the end of the story and we get to live towards that end. But Jesus means what he says about our hearts. Jesus-centered peacemakers step towards conflict with curiosity, humility, and self-sacrificial love. But the thing is, even the depth of where Jesus will go just a couple of verses later is to say, even to love our enemies. So this is what I would hope. If, if we take anything away today, this is what I would hope we take away. Jesus-centered peacemakers step towards conflict with curiosity, humility, and self-sacrificial love. That's pretty simple, right? All right. Go for it. We got this. <laughs> no problem. It sounds nice, doesn't it? Almost even sounds like it could be simple. Those are good words. But it is anything but simple. It is anything but easy. It is anything but just be able to try this thing easily, right? When I think about just the last few weeks, the conversations I've had with some of you and people in my life, people are experiencing deep conflict in all directions. People are experiencing conflict within their families. I was talking to someone whose spouse is on the other side of the political spectrum than them. Those who have deep relational strain with their adult children, conflict that goes back years now. Those who are experiencing conflict at work due to political tension. People who are reconsidering their plans to travel over the holidays because there is just so much dysfunction going on in their family system. It's in turmoil. I've heard from those who are in high levels of leadership in their organizations saying that they have to navigate deep conflict in their organizations and their leadership roles. So if any of that sounds familiar to you, you are not alone. The list could go on, right? And so in the midst of all that, here is our call to be Jesus-centered peacemakers that step towards conflict with curiosity, humility, and self-sacrificial love. How in the world do we do that? I hope that's the question that comes up in your mind. 
about a year ago, that question was really on my heart. I was realizing, oh, as I thought about this year, 2024, specifically when it comes to political polarization, as I thought about those stories that I had heard from all of you, I was praying and I was like, God, we've got to have ways to move forward because if you tell us that it's good to be a peacemaker, how do we start that process? How do we do that in our lives? My goal as a pastor is not to get everyone to think the same thing or to have the same views. That'd be kind of a silly goal. Doesn't, doesn't that sound silly? Uh, my hope, rather, is that people would be in the same room and be able to stay in the same room with those that they disagree with because they so deeply see those people as made in the image of God and loved by God just like they are. Like, that's my deepest hope. So last year, I began to go on just a deep dive into the resources I could find on practical ways to live out peacemaking. I began to talk to experts that I knew who had spent time in peacemaking in our country, around the world, in interpersonal relationships with family members. And so, uh, long story short, Dr. Ramon, Ramon Pastrano, who's on our leadership team here at Mill City, and Pastor Gary, who's a pastor down at Mercy Vineyard Church, we developed a training that many of you attended. And we just called it Peacemaking in Polarized Times, tools and training to love our neighbors and our families and our coworkers. Now, this didn't answer all of those questions, but we knew it must have been a need because over 300 people attended those trainings. There's now four other communities that are reproducing their tra that training in other spaces right now. And we even got a little bit of media coverage for the effort earlier this week, if you didn't see it um, on NPR. We talked about the way of Jesus when it comes to peacemaking. And we rooted the whole conversation in these verses on the Sermon on the Mount and other places throughout Scripture, but the core was here in this rooted in this part of Scripture. Many of you made it to the training. Thank you for coming. Today, I am going to do the two-hour training in 10 minutes. I'm just kidding. I'm, somebody's like, give me my two hours back. No, I'm just kidding. I, I'm just going to give you like the overview of it because I actually, on, on the hub, there is a blog that has all the resources that we had from the training. So if you missed it or if you want to share it with other people, there's the resources, there is the workbook, all of the items there. But I do want to just quickly tell you like what the overview was. Like why did we, what, what did we come to when it came to like how are we going to take these steps? Because there is no easy answer for this situation. I'm not trying to say that. However, I would be willing to say that if we were to truly live out the steps that I'm about to outline, it would be a huge game changer in the peacemaking realities of our lives and our communities. It wouldn't fix everything, but it would change a lot if we could all do these steps. So here's what they are. Step one, self-awareness. Step two, reframe your goals. Step three, listen. Step four, emotional intelligence. And step five, dialogue rather than debate. And what we found out is that most people said, thank you for this initial conversation. I need more resources. So the link of all the go deeper resources are also on the blog post that I sent there on the, on the hub. Let me just talk briefly through this. Step one, self-awareness. When I think about peacemaking, it's a tendency for me to think about other people. Right? Like those people, their issues that they have. But what if we were to acknowledge our own inner polarizer, which is what the group Braver Angels calls it, our own inner polarizer. Look at these just two of the many questions that they have from Braver Angels to outline how does this make us feel? How would we answer this? Don't, don't answer it out loud. How often do I feel a rush of pleasure with friends when we hear of mistakes or embarrassing actions about the other side? Often, sometimes, rarely. How often do I consider those on the other side of my perspective my enemy rather than my neighbor, often, sometimes, rarely. You can see the other 11 questions that help us identify our inner polarizer, but for many of us, we have to at least say sometimes for these. I know I do. But if we are able to recognize and have self-awareness of our inner polarizer, guess what? We can confront what they call in Braver Angels the agents of polarization, okay? Right? Do, do, do. The agents of polarization. Stereotyping, dismissing, ridiculing, contempt, the four major issues when it comes to the, these agents of polarization. We're all up against polarization. It's our common enemy. What's going on inside of us? Could we notice those things before they even come out our mouths? Ooh, that'd be good because Jesus cares about our hearts. Okay, we awareness. Self-awareness but also community awareness. Y'all awareness as we saw in that, that way of putting it. 
This is important. This is what the research shows. We are not as polarized as we feel that we are. The studies that is happening across the U.S. around polarization is finding that we are not as polarized as we think we are. But get this, our, polar, our, pol our politicians are more ideologically polarized than the general population. Oh, nobody's shocked. Okay. And they are more polarized statistically than they have been in the last 50 years. This is what's called affective polarization, the feeling of polarization. We feel more polarized than we actually are. This is called a perception gap. A perception gap between what's actually happening and what's true. Affective polarization causes us to feel like the divide is wider than it actually is. We awareness. Okay, that's the first step, self-awareness. The second step, reframe our goals. When we approach others in a conversation, when we know we disagree, I think oftentimes our goal is to change their mind or to win an argument. Statistically, that is near impossible. So a reality check might be, do we have other goals for these conversations? At least one other goal, or maybe we shouldn't even have the conversation in the first place. Here's just a few other goals we might have for depolarizing conversations across difference. Humanizing somebody who thinks different than you. Empathizing and understanding someone that is different than you. Relating with love like the greatest commandment invites us to do from Jesus. Having compassion, which means entering into the suffering of somebody else. What goals might you have when you think about the people who you have the biggest differences of agreement with uh, when it comes to politics or anything else? What other goals might you have besides winning the argument or changing their mind if that's pretty an unrealistic goal? Wouldn't that change the conversation if you went in knowing what your actual goal was? Okay, step three, listen. During the training, we did some listening exercises. They were fun. Uh, and I do think that almost all of us need to practice listening regularly. Like, it's not something we achieve. It's an ongoing practice that we all have to do. And the goal is to get to the deepest level of listening. It's sometimes called generative listening. And here's that definition. It's more than just hearing statements that someone is saying, but it's also having empathy and a willingness to learn and grow from what they're saying, even if you don't disagree with them. You can learn and grow from what someone's saying even if you're disagreeing with them. Generative listening. What a different world we would be in if we could just snap our fingers and we could all be amazing listeners. Wouldn't that be a different world? Turns out that doesn't work. We actually have to practice, though. So you can try the snap, snapping the finger part, but I have found it doesn't work. My husband agrees. So step four. Emotional intelligence. Listen, there's a lot of resources you can find on this. Uh, Dr. Ramon and I were like, we could do a, a graduate level class on this. Like, we love this topic. It's so important. But simply put, go find those other resources. But simply put, it has to start with being able to identify our own emotions, which is the first thing that's difficult for most of us to do. Here at Mill City, we put like a feelings chart like this one up here. Uh, this one is Pluchik's Wheel, one of my favorite ones. This is on the resources on the hub. Uh, but putting those things up, they're giving us some words for our emotions and for our feelings. And what we've talked about here at Mill City is God can handle our emotions, all of them. God made us with the ability to feel and to learn and understand things about ourselves and the world through what we feel. And so other people can't always handle our emotions, but God can. And that's why it's important for us to know. Look at this other tool that Dr. Ramon brought to the training. It's called the Mood Elevator. I hadn't seen it before. But the idea is that when it comes to certain emotions and feelings, we have higher quality of thinking with some emotions and feelings. And when we get to the elevator, when we get to the lower levels of the elevator, our thinking quality gets low. Low thinking quality is not great for dialogue, is it? So when we think about our emotions and our mood, perhaps before we're even having a conversation, let's make sure we get to the lobby of the mood elevator, maybe curious, maybe even to compassionate. That would be cool. We might not get to grateful. That's okay. But what if we got a little higher on the mood elevator before we entered into a conversation of peacemaking? Emotional intelligence. Okay, finally, step five, dialogue. The part everyone's excited about, dialogue, right? We have to know the difference between debate and dialogue. This is maybe the most critical thing. Debate starts with answers on both sides. No one is coming to learn from the other person. Rather, the goal is to win. And at the end, usually both people lose. But dialogue starts with questions. It starts with curiosity. So perhaps 
It's not time to start a dialogue until you have some curiosity about who you're speaking with. And here is the, the tool that I want us to remember that we have. Of all the tools that we could give you, we have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Spirit leads, guides, comforts, corrects. Might be the one that says, Shh, still keep listening. Might be the one that says, hey, have courage and say this. Hey, this isn't about you. This is about a bigger thing. The Spirit counsels us, guides us, leads us. We have the greatest tool in peacemaking that anybody in the world has, and that's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. So before you go into any dialogue, whether you're planning it out or you're like, whoop, I guess we're having a dialogue right now, would you allow that to remind you to welcome the Holy Spirit to that space? To just offer a quick prayer, spirit, be present, lead, guide. There's a lot of tools of how to have dialogues that are kind of like memory tools. So I'm just going to give you one of them that we use in the training. And this is also from Braver Angels. Highly recommend their trainings. They're having them all the time. They're free. You can get those on the resources. But here's what they, they have. They have this tool that they call LAPP. L-A-P-P. -P, LAPP. I'm not sure if you're dialoguing, you're going to like remember your LAPP. I don't know. But that's what the acronym is. Okay. And uh, when we think about this, it's listen. And then it's acknowledge pivot, and perspective. I'll explain that real quick. But before I explain that, I want to, to, re to just, I'll share something that felt to me like an aha moment. What if the deepest peacemaking work that you're supposed to do, that you're called to do, is among the people who actually are in a similar set of beliefs as you? The people who are polarized, who are dehumanizing, who are seeing those, uh, those polarizing things, contempt, name-calling, stereotyping, ridiculing, dismissing, things that sometimes we find ourselves internally or externally experiencing. What if one of our deep callings is amongst our own group? To be people who say, we got to have a different posture. we got to share a different perspective. We're not even trying to agree with the other side. But will we be people who are willing to see others as God sees them. What if that's our deepest call when it comes to this acronym? So LAP, again, listen, acknowledge, pivot, perspective. Lots of this on the resources, but listen, again, that's our step. But right when you get to that dialogue, make sure there's not a little bit more listening to do. Like what's even happening that day? Start with a question, not an answer. That's how you listen as step number one. Then acknowledge. Acknowledge what you heard. Hey, we've practiced this before. So what I hear you saying is, right? Okay, we know how to do that. So let me see if I understand what you're saying. There's ways to do that. And then if it's possible, share a way that you might agree. Because often at the core of an issue is something that we both value just differently and we have different thoughts about how we can achieve that value. And so if you're having a disagreement about something, uh, we use the example in the training of like how, how things should go in public schools. We know that's divisive, right? But if people have emotions about that, that means they must care about kids and education. I can see that we both care about kids and education. Do you see how that can actually change the whole conversation? And then here's the thing. Ask them if they're willing to pivot to listen to your perspective. Actually say, could I share my perspective? Or might, might I share a different perspective? Guess what? If you ask and they say no, don't. <laughs> But what if we asked? Like what if we were willing to say, do you want to hear my perspective? And then offer a perspective. But listen, it has to be a depolarizing perspective. No name calling or contempt or stereotyping or dehumanizing people. For instance, you might say, perhaps it's more complicated than we are acknowledging so far. Or maybe you might offer a perspective like, you know what, our side has not been perfect on this either. Or perhaps you'd say a perspective like, well, here's how I've come to understand the issue. I'm just one person, but here's how I see it. These are offering a depolarizing viewpoint. If the person is not willing to listen, you guys, we've got to accept that. We have to accept that the dialogue might not be able to continue. It can be so hard to do that. But here's the thing. It takes two people to have a dialogue, right? So if we're thinking about the relationships that are closest to us, there's probably going to need to be multiple dialogues. It's probably going to be an ongoing process. Is that going to take perseverance? Absolutely. But if you have gone through this process of LAP, listen, acknowledge, pivot, perspective, a couple of times, and that person is still just completely putting up a wall to you, doesn't want to hear your perspective, 
then we need to nicely exit the conversation. Like we have to get out of the conversation. If they're being unkind to you, guess what? Get out of the conversation. You, don't, you need to be treated as a human made in God's image as well. Peacemaking does not mean that we stand firm and just let someone dehumanize us. But we do the best we can with the tools we have. And you might need to practice statements of getting out of the conversation. We have these on the... On the of time uh, putting if effort into those things. There are a couple of more trainings that are happening that other churches are hosting. But all you need to think about is what is your next step. Peacemaking is not for the faint of heart, right? Most of us probably will always need to keep practicing and finding the right resources for our next step. All you need to do is to take one step at a time. That's it. What is your next step? I know how tempting it is to be discouraged. I know. But don't lose hope. I'm telling you, we can trust Jesus when he says it's good to be a peacemaker, even though that might be one of the most challenging aspects of our lives. Because here's, again, the takeaway. Jesus-centered peacemakers step towards conflict with generous, self-sacrificial love. It's good. We can believe Jesus when he says that. So before we close, I want to just acknowledge that the political polarization is why a lot of you are facing conflict interpersonally in your life right now. I know that. I'm listening to your stories. I hear that. I see that in my own life. And I have been, I hope you're encouraged by this, like just praying over our community during this election season and just praying. And I just want to share my heart with you. And don't worry, I have no intentions to say anything controversial, okay? But I have noticed in so many conversations and in myself that there's a temptation to view those who vote differently than us as our enemies. But I deeply hope that we can see that even though for so many it feels like there's a lot at stake, those who disagree with us politically are people who are also loved by God and made in God's image. So I love what Dr. Ramon uh, recently wrote about the way of Jesus and how it's often countercultural. Look at what he said here. Our role as disciples is not to be swept away by the currents of popular opinion or to be co-opted by political movements. We must be willing to critique the ideologies of both the left and the right, recognizing that neither fully aligns with the kingdom of God Following Jesus challenges every human system, every ideology, and every political platform. To be an apprentice or a disciple of Jesus is to be radically different than the world around us. It means that we have to see our primary identity as Jesus followers over any other identities. It doesn't mean that those don't matter. I know that some of the categories help us understand the world, but we have to see our primary identity as children of God because the peacemakers are the children of God. So my heart for us and my hope as we head into this election season in a couple of weeks is that we all are ready to live with that moment and whatever happens afterwards, here's my heart for you. And I wrote it down just so it's really clear. That as a church, we would model something different than the world. Regardless of who you vote for, or if you vote, you are welcome here in our community, and this is my hope that we would prayerfully consider these things. To give our primary allegiance to the kingdom of God and to Jesus as our leader. To see politics through the way of Jesus, not Jesus through our politics. To be motivated by self-sacrificial love and engaging others in a posture of humility, even when it costs us relationally. To stay curious about why our neighbors and friends and sometimes family see things differently and choose, choose to listen deeply. Step towards conflict with others with the goal of peacemaking, not merely changing other people's minds. This is how I've been praying for our community. This is my hope for our community as we continue to go forward. And so you can join me in praying this over our community as we continue on these next few weeks, these next 16 days. But also beyond, right? 
So the band can come up, and as I think about just concluding this conversation, this is the end of the good life, these beatitudes, we see these three sets of three blessings, these three sets of three proclamations, nine proclamations of who God is and how God is working within the world. And I would hope that we would be turning these over in our hearts and our minds for a lifetime. That we would read them regularly, allowing these statements about what the good life actually is to just embed themselves into our whole being, into all of who we are. So that is my prayer for us as we go on from take the Beatitudes, as we continue on in the Sermon on the Mount, that we would allow these to shape who we are. Pastor John is going to lead us in communion, which is always an opportunity of peacemaking with God in your heart with other people, and maybe even with somebody else before you participate. So she'll lead us as we move forward in our time of worship.